Hi everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures on Anatomy and Physiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. If you're watching these videos, they are intended for use by my students taking my Human Anatomy and Physiology courses at Del Mar College. Anyone else out there in YouTube land finds these helpful, by all means use them to your advantage, but know that these are designed for my students. So, uh, we've been doing a series of sensory physiology videos for my Part 2 A&P class. This is the last in the series. This is the, the um, video on hearing and how hearing works. So as you guys know, we've been looking at the anatomy of the uh, ear and lab, and I'm gonna go over some of that anatomy here. So um, when we look at the external part of the ear, what, we have, what we'll see here is we'll see this. We'll see the pinna or auricle, which is the part of your ear that we typically call the ear. The opening is called the external auditory meatus. There's a tube that runs from the external auditory meatus and two, up to a structure called the tympanic membrane, which is your eardrum. Okay? And then on the back side of the eardrum is a series of small bones called the auditory ossicles. The, os the auditory ossicles, ickle means little and os means bone, so the first auditory ossicle or small bone that's going to sit here is going to sit with its base on the back of the tympanic membrane. And this bone is called the malleus. I'll put an M for malleus. That is connected to a bone called the incus. Malleus means mallet. Incus means anvil, like you set a horseshoe or a sword on an anvil to hammer. And then that is connected to a small stirrup-shaped bone, which is called the stapes. So in the language that these words originated in, the E would be pronounced stapes. So um, not stapes. So anyway. Those are the three auditory ossicles. Now, obviously, this is not drawn to scale. At this size, these ossicles would still be very, very tiny, but they're here to illustrate. Now, I'm going to erase this. We know it's malleus, incus, and stapes in that order. Now, when we look at the inner ear where they're connected, there's an enlarged area called the vestibule, and then over here is the coiled snail shell called the cochlea. Over here would be your three semicircular canals, and I've kind of tilted this back so that we could see it. The stapes sits in an opening over or within the bony labyrinth called the oval window. And somewhere over here is another opening called the round window, and the membranous labyrinth is also kind of covering that. Also in lab, what you guys should know is if we cut this cochlea right here and look down the tube, there's a series of three chambers. So we're going to have the outer bony covering. This is another model that we did in lab that will look like this. This is all bony labyrinth, but within the cochlea, the bony labyrinth starts to grow across here. The membranous labyrinth comes across forming part of the basilar membrane, extends up forming the vestibular membrane, and also hugs the inner wall here. So in the cochlea, the membranous labyrinth is not sitting in the middle like it is in the semicircular canals. It's actually up against the bone and seals this off into three chambers. As you should have learned in lab, this is called the vestibular duct or scala vestibuli, the tympanic, I'm sorry, the cochlear duct or scala cochlei, and the tympanic duct or scala tympani. Now it's in the cochlear duct sitting on the basilar membrane that we have a small mound of cells called the organ of corti or spiral organ of corti. And there's a membrane hang hanging over that called the tectorial membrane. We have these small groups of cells that have little cilia sticking up called hair cells, the inner and outer hair cells. Those cells are going to synapse on some other neurons and they'll send their axons over here to a group of cells called the spiral ganglion and then those axons will go out through the cochlear nerve and join the rest of the vestibulocochlear nerve. Okay, So that's sort of the anatomy. Now this tube if I extend it this way, this tube is this tube unfolded. And I would see these three chambers running all the way through here. It's a little bit hard to visualize, but nonetheless, let's just say that I ran the vestibular membrane all the way down to a certain point and the tectorial membrane all the way down to a certain point. I still have vestibular duct, cochlear duct, tympanic duct, and the organ of corti would extend all the way down the entire length here with all these little hair cells. That's why when we look in lab at the models, especially the inner ear model, we break this part off, you see the three tubes repeating and repeating and repeating as they coil in. We've just uncoiled the cochlea, and all these little hair cells would be going all the way down, 
much closer together and the tectorial membrane would be hanging over them. So it's as if we're looking at this on end extend all the way down. I hope that anatomy makes sense to you. Now, this is how hearing works. One of the things that people don't see is that the round window is the opening at one end of this vestibular duct. I'm sorry, of the tympanic duct. The vestibular duct would be here where the oval window is. And so technically, I have a plate of bone covering this and I have the stapes sitting here. And then I would have the malleus and the incus. So the stapes is sitting over the end of the vestibular duct. The fluid in the vestibular duct would be called perilymph. So all the way around here, I have perilymph. And really these two ducts are connected and are the same tube, just they named it differently because they first looked at it this way. Now, this would be the cochlear duct and it's filled with endolymph. Perilymph, endolymph, perilymph. Got it? So here's how a hearing is gonna work when we understand all of this. So as sound waves come in and they hit the ear, one of the things that the pinna does is it sort of acts like a funnel and funnels sound into the external auditory meatus and the external auditory canal. If uh, you're facing an opposite direction, then it becomes harder to hear. That's why we need to turn to someone to hear better, to allow our ears to funnel the sound waves, the vibrations of air molecules hitting this, and those vibrations get funneled in this way, and they hit the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane will begin to vibrate. As it vibrates, it's going to wiggle the malleus, the incus, and stapes. The function of the tympanic membrane is it converts sound into mechanical movement, into physical movement. That's its main function, converting sound into physical movement. Now, when it starts to move, the three bones are going to amplify that movement. They act like levers. For example, if I grabbed my elbow and I moved it just a little bit one way or the other, the other end of my hand, where my hand is, would move a great deal. So as one end of the malleus moves a little bit with the tympanic membrane, the other end moves a lot, which causes the incus to amplify the motion, and that really causes the stapes to pump on the end of this channel. That will begin to create pressure waves of fluid in the vestibular duct. When those pressure waves slam into the tectorial membrane, that will cause pressure waves in the um, endolymph and the cochlear duct and the basilar membrane and all the membranes will start to vibrate. It's almost as if I had two water balloons or three water balloons, like long tubes next to each other really tight. If I thump one, then the fluid in one is gonna cause ripples in the others or vibrations and waves in the others. What happens then is that as these membranes are vibrating, it will jam these hair cells into the tectorial membrane. These hair cells in the cochlea are mechanoreceptors. They have ion channels in the hairs, and if we bend them, that starts to open sodium or potassium channels, altering resting membrane potential of these cells. They'll send an action potential out to the spiral ganglion, out through the cochlear nerve, into our brain, and tell us that we're hearing. So those are the steps of audition. They're on the bottom of page 19 in my note set that the pinna of the ear will channel sound waves and vibrations into the external auditory canal and vibrate the tympanic membrane. The vibrations of the tympanic membrane will cause the malleus to start to, um, to start to amplify the sound. It'll start to vibrate or wiggle, so to speak. And then because of the way the malleus is attached, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes will all begin to vibrate together, amplifying that motion, all right? Um, because the stapes is attached here, it will begin pumping and creating waves in the vestibular duct, okay? Those pressure waves in the vestibular duct are in the fluid called perilymph. That perilymph will cause all of these membranes to start to vibrate, and it will cause the hair cells to begin to jam in and start a receptor potential or an action potential traveling out through the cochlear nerve to our brain. So you can kind of see the steps in order. We funnel sound into the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane vibrates and starts to wiggle the malleus. The malleus will move the, the incus and stapes. That creates pressure waves in the perilymph and the vestibular duct. 
that will cause the other two membranes with the endolymph and perilymph to all start vibrating, jamming hair cells into the tectorial membrane, altering resting membrane potential, and they would all be sending axons out through the spiral ganglion out the cochlear nerve. So you should know those steps. They're written on the bottom of page 13, okay? Now, here's something that's interesting. We were talking about wavelengths when we talked about photons of light. Well, when we make sounds with our voice, if you were to sit there and hum at a certain tone, like a really low sound, for example, if someone hit a bass drum, the bass drum will vibrate and the sound waves will all have the same wavelength. The wavelength usually tells us the pitch of a sound. The amplitude or the height of the wave will tell us about the volume. So you can see if I took this wave here and I took another wave of the same wavelength, they cycle at the same time. They would have the same pitch. They might both be a bass drum or a very low hum. Except for one would be very quiet, the other one would be very loud. So the wavelength tells us about the pitch of the sound. The height of the wave, called the amplitude, tells us about the volume. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. So a very high-pitched sound will have a smaller wavelength or a shorter wavelength. Low pitch sounds have a longer wavelength. It turns out that the closer to the oval window that we stimulate, the higher the frequency of sound we're hearing. So very high frequency vibrations here cause the waves to slam in here, triggering these cells. If I stuck an electrode into these neurons and caused them to fire, even if you weren't listening, you would hear a very high pitched sound, like a cymbal or a piece of glass breaking. Very low frequency vibrations will stimulate much deeper or more distal to the oval window. So depending on where I stimulate a, the hair cells along this passageway determines the pitch of the sound. Close to the oval window, high pitch. Further away is a low pitch sound, okay? And that's based on the frequencies of vibrations. Now I'm gonna erase this. I'm gonna cover one last thing, which is actually the first part of hearing on this page. But I hope you have the anatomy and physiology all linked together. So now I'm gonna talk about pitch and volume, and then I think we're done with a lot of this stuff. There's a lot more we could cover, but there's a way too much information to cover in one semester. If I cover everything, you learn nothing. So now, when I talked about the wavelength of sound, or the, what we can do is we can do this. I didn't draw this very well, because, you know, but let's pretend that these waves are the exact same length from this wave to this one, to the next one. So if I have a certain frequency, that means how frequently does this wave crest? If I measure that over a period of time, then we call from going from top to bottom to top one cycle. If I measure for one second, then this might be one, two, three cycles per second. So that would be the frequency. How frequently does it peak? So when we talk about the pitch of a sound, whether it's high pitch or low pitch, we can talk about cycles per second, which is also referred to as the frequency, and that is measured in a term that we call hertz. You hear about gigahertz and megahertz. Well, the term hertz refers to the cycles per second. And there's a scientist named Hertz that figured all this stuff out. Now, the human ear can hear somewhere between about um, 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz, or 20,000 cycles per second. So if someone broke some glass or hit a cymbal, then that would be a much more frequent sound, much higher hertz. 20,000 hertz would be like you know, glass breaking. And then thunder at a distance would be around 20 hertz, okay? Something really low or low rumble. So that tells us about the pitch of the sound. As I said before, if I have the same pitch, but I can change the amplitude of the wave, how tall the waves are, then this would be louder, a greater volume. So when we measure the volume of the sound, volume is measured in the term amplitude, or the height of the wave. And the person who described this was a guy who named, I believe, the terms after himself called decibels. So we can hear 
a certain number of decibels is how loud it is, okay? That's pretty much all that I want you guys to know about that. You should know that the pitch of the wave is measured in cycles per second. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the pitch. The shorter the wavelength, the more cycles per second it is. The longer the wavelength, the fewer cycles per second, or the lower the pitch, and we measure that in hertz. 20 hertz, or the lower the hertz, the lower the, to the tone, or the lower the pitch. For volume, we measure in decibels. The, the higher the number of decibels, the larger the waves, the louder that it is. Anyway, I hope you learned something. I hope you found this helpful. You guys keep doing this stuff until you can't stand it and then do it three more times. Master this, be able to teach it to someone else and you'll be ready to make your A in the test, all right? Hope you had as much fun as I did. I'll see y'all for the next round.